Bonsoir tout le monde. Good evening, everyone. C'est un très grand plaisir d'être ici avec vous ce soir par cette très belle soirée d'hiver. Um, my name is Benoît Antoine Bacon. I'm the Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs here at Concordia University. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the second of four Thinking Out Loud conversations that are brought to you in partnership by Concordia University and the Globe and Mail. Finding new ways to communicate our research and to make it accessible to the public is an important part of our mission here at Concordia. And that's the spirit behind the conversation series. Two more exciting sessions are scheduled in this series. To register, please do visit concordia.ca. Tonight's topic is particularly interesting, the academics of circus. Our conversationalists tonight are Patrick Leroux, Associate Professor in the Department of English and the Département d'Études Françaises, and Lynn Hewart, Executive Producer for Special Projects and former COO of the Cirque du Soleil, whom I will introduce first. The Cirque du Soleil is widely recognized as one of the most innovative and creative companies in the world, one of Montreal's most successful and universally acclaimed cultural exports. Lynn Ewart developed and managed that creative fire for much of the company's history. At the Cirque, Lynn was responsible for managing, guiding, and channeling the creative force of the company's designers, performers, artisans, and technicians into a product that was both breathtakingly original and commercially successful. In 2006, she published the book, The Spark, igniting the creative fire that lives within us all. Drawing on behind the scenes stories from the most creative people in entertainment, it's an unparalleled guide on how to make creativity a part of everything you do. The hit shows Varikai, Zumanity, and Ka were created under her guidance. Her command of five languages, English, French, German, Russian, and Spanish, helped her to open direct lines of communications with Cirque du Soleil's artists and partners all over the world. Still deeply connected with the development of young athletes and performers, she's presently working as an ambassador and executive producer for special projects for the Cirque du Soleil. She's also lent her creative expertise to the Vancouver 2010 Olympic Organizing Committee as a member of its creative team and as associate producer of an eight-minute segment presented during the closing ceremonies of the 2006 Torino Olympic Games. Our second conversationalist is our own Patrick Leroux. Dr. Leroux is a playwright, director, an associate professor who holds a joint appointment in the departments of English and Etudes Françaises. He holds a PhD in theater from Sorbonne Nouvelle, Université de Paris 3. Dr. Leroux's academ academic research focuses on research creation, cultural discourse, self-representation in Quebec drama, literatures on the margins, and contemporary circus and performance. He is the first scholar to win both national prizes awarded by the Canadian Association for Theatre Research for Best Article in Theatre and Performance Studies, the 2010 Prix Jean-Cléo Godin for articles in French, and the 2013 Richard Plant Award for articles in English. He's the author of over 30 plays, films, and radio plays that have been performed in Canada and abroad. He's also heavily involved in university-based research creation, such as theatrical productions, film, dance, and video installation through Concordia's Hexagram Institute. He's received major funding from the, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and Les Fonds de Recherche du Québec for his research on circus, including his work that relates to the Cirque du Soleil. Finally, I'm pleased to introduce tonight's moderator, Madame Sophie Cousineau. As you know, Sophie Cousineau is the Globe and Mail's chief Quebec correspondent. She earned a bachelor's degree in economics and political science from McGill and a master's degree in journalism from the University of Illinois. She's been a journalist for over 20 years, and prior to joining the, the Globe in 2012, she was business columnist for La Presse here in Montreal. But before we welcome Sophie to the stage, 
Let's get a taste of tonight's topic, the circus itself. We're very happy to have students from the National Circus School with us here tonight. They've collaborated with Patrick Leroux, Les Sadois de la Main, and Geodésic to bring us a one-of-a-kind performance. Prepare to be amazed as you witness the next generation of the circus. Thank you. I'm not who you think I am. I'm not who I think I am. Who do you think you are? Vem tror du är? Kuka sa oikein luulet olevas? Vem? Who do you think you are? Who am I?
Who would you like to be? Who would you like to be? Who would you like to be? Who are you going to be before life came in front of you? Who are you? My name is Seth. I'm the third son of Adam and Eve, or if you prefer, the Egyptian god of chaos and destruction. To my parents, I'm the third son, but little do they know the chaos and destruction that I'm capable of. Little do they know, or do they? They must. They can't not. Flesh and blood, family ties, nurture and nature, all of that. They must. It can't all be chaos and destruction. Guess what, Dad? I keep having these dreams. Dreams where my family and friends are flying together. Clouds of friends. Little puffs of conversation. Styles. Friends. Topics. Chaos and you knew right, you've always known, yet nothing ever said. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, the death, the brother's stain and then my birth. Did I wash Cain's stain? Did I bring back Abel? Guess who placed me in your lap? The fruitful one, saith, chaos, Seth. Nature, breath, short, shorter, soon, I'll take flight. I will not be grounded. I know you knew. Chaos and third sun, the fruitful one. Multiply, multiply, multiply. I will not be grounded. Bonsoir, good evening. Um, 
it's going to be cliche, but it's really a tough act to follow for me. Um, my name is Sophie Cousineau, and I'm pleased to be your host tonight uh, for what promises to be a fascinating talk into the academics of circus. Uh, what struck me in the uh, act that we just saw is how studied it is, and it's not a word that I use carelessly. Circus in Quebec has gone quite a long way from the old street days, uh, street art of the public amuser. It has evolved into one of the uh, most sophisticated art forms. It integrates technologies, multimedia, it spans a number of artistic disciplines from dance and gymnastics to opera and theater. And yet, uh, circus has long resisted the academic scrutiny, uh, partly in fear of exposing its trade secrets. The story behind this hack, though, is, is telling of how things are starting to change. Uh, it was born out of a collaboration uh, of two creative companies and the École Nationale du Cirque, which is a performing arts school. And a university professor in drama and playwriting was embedded in the whole creative process. Uh, this was a lab, a true university lab, but outside of the walls of, of Concordia University. So to discuss the uh, academics of circus and to look into the creative processes that work in this art form, um, please join me in welcoming uh, Patrick Leroux and Lynn Heward, from, uh, formerly from the Cirque du Soleil, and Mr. Leroux from uh, Concordia University. So, um, sorry, I will start. Uh, contrary to form with uh, Mr. Leroux, um, because I'm, I'm curious uh, about what brought you, a professor in uh, playwriting, to an art form that was long considered minor in certain university circles, at least. <laughs> um, right. Um, it, it actually was uh, somewhat by accident. Um, I, I first became interested in circus and, through Cirque du Soleil. Um, most, more specifically, I knew a number of theater artists who were talking about their various adventures in Vegas, and, uh, and I thought, wow, um, what, what are Quebec uh, theater artists doing in Vegas? Well, what does this mean? I was studying the discourse of Quebec theater. I was studying uh, notions of self-representation. Self, self um, and so I, I went to Vegas to see uh, the Soleil shows, and um, very shortly after, I was basically sucked into the circus world uh, in great part because of uh, people at National Circus School. Um, Patrice Aubertin, for instance, who's a research chair there, um, who essentially told me, if you're going to study circus, come and really study circus. Don't look at it from the outside. You need to experience this from the inside. And that's, that's what happened. From within. Is that how the working group on circus uh, started, or, uh, um, or was it a longer process? And what does it do yeah. exactly, or as we say in French, qu'est-ce que ça mange en hiver? <laughs> qu'est-ce que ça mange en hiver? Um, so, for, first of all, the, uh, the working group essentially four or five years ago was Norma Rantisi, who I saw, uh, Aaron Hurley at McGill, uh, Karen Fricker at University of London, and myself. Uh, we were four or five academics sitting around a table and uh, essentially sharing our research from different angles, from economics, from aesthetics, from history, from um, um, various angles. And slowly but surely, uh, as soon as word got out that academics were actually working on this, students found out about it, MA students, PhD students, and uh, yeah, four years later, um, there's, uh, 182 people uh, on our mailing list. Uh, about 150 different people have come to different events we've organized over the over the last uh, two years, uh, specifically. Uh, we we basically serve as a um, uh, sort of a, uh, a catalyst, a place for people to be able to think about circus freely, uh, not feel like they're they're talking about it sort of with an eye to a contract, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and what's great is that we've basically brought together um, industry people, we've brought together academics, and uh, the, the circus school, the, the pedagogues as, as well. So it's a very multidisciplinary approach. Yeah, it's fundamentally interdisciplinary. 
um, bilingual as well, French English. And basically, we thought we'd sort of run out of ideas after a year or two, uh, after we had been working on Sage Sarai, and then we realized uh, quite recently, uh, coming out of a process where we've, I've just uh, co-edited a book, um, we have 600 pages of scholarly writing on Quebec circus. Really? So that just, and I just wrote the epilogue and I felt like, okay, there's at least another book to, to produce quickly because we haven't covered nearly you know, half of what needs to be covered at this point. Okay. It's a virgin territory. It's, so little has been done. But it's not uh, necessarily just a theoretical, it's very concrete. If we look at the, the, yeah. the um, the number that we were, the act that we just saw. Can you tell us a little bit about how the creative process, uh, you were there from the beginning, I think you yeah. were embedded in that team, so, so. Uh, yeah, so, so a few words about what you saw. Basically it was um, an excerpt of an ongoing research creation um, project, uh, which combines, fascinatingly combines uh, uh, the National Circus School students and, and uh, the, the research chair uh, as well. Said um, de la main, and this was directed by Sam Tetro, who's in, who's in, the, in the room tonight. Uh, thank you, Sam. Um, there, there was also uh, a company, a multimedia company called Geodesic, and uh, basically Geodesic and Seven Fingers of the Hand, Said de la main, uh, are involved in the um, research chair, uh, the Canada Research, Canada Industrial Research Chair in Circus Arts um, at the National Circus School. And they, they basically wanted to explore well, a lot of what you saw, like how, how, do, you, how do you create basically a performative screen? How, how do you uh, create warmth uh, from, from using video? How, how do you avoid video as being simply um, tapestry? Uh, how do, what are the codes also that, that you engage with here? Um, and I, I became involved quite simply because Patrice, uh, I had proposed a project on, on high wire and film. And uh, Patrice said, oh, really interesting uh, project, but no. Um, <laughs> you're going to work with them. Um, and and I, I'm so glad he did because basically I would have been on my own and fumbling and trying stuff, whereas I was basically, as, as you said, embedded with a team of people who, who knew absolutely what they were doing. And I, I learned so much of this process. Um, originally, I was basically the... Um, you know, the nerdy professor would stand around and sort of take notes, and, and I thought that was going to be my, my role. Uh, but Sa Sam Tetro would have none of it. He very quickly gave me a very active role, um, essentially assisting him. Um, he was pushing me to write texts as well. Um, and these texts basically came from uh, the artists themselves. Um, the Sadoua de la Main focuses on uh, the individual. Um, I guess it's sort of the anti Cirque du Soleil in a sense. The Cirque du Soleil has like 75 people on stage and, and, and <laughs> makeup and leak around and stuff. And said, well, they're in street clothes and you know, they usually have this moment where they, they address the audience and hi, I'm, I'm Patrick and I like this type of stuff and um, here's what I can do, that, that, that sort of uh, approach. And Sam basically came in with a, with a questionnaire for all of the artists. And um, he gave the questionnaire to me and, and, and said, yeah, see what you can do with this. And, and basically, uh, in the case of what we, what we saw today, I guess I can talk about it very, very briefly so Lynn can get, <laughs> get some space uh, to, to speak as well. Um, uh, Seth, uh, his name really is Seth. Um, S Seth was one of the artists involved in, this, in the uh, first and second workshops. Um, in the second workshops, we, we asked them, um, please, te please tell us a secret. And um, have you told the secret to someone? And he basically said in, in his questionnaire, very naively, not knowing he was writing this and it was going to be read by a writer, um, I'm coming out to my parents uh, over Christmas. And I thought, oh my God, can I, can I work with this? And I wrote him a text and then I showed it to him and he sort of looked at me and I was like, oh, <laughs> you've written me. Um, but it was, it was actually an amazing moment because he, he basically made it his own. It became his text. It became an extension of himself. It became also a sort of working theme for me in the sense that um, the, the, these people take incredible risks. And the risk I hadn't seen them take was that of um, speech. Voicing that. Voicing. 
uh, la prise de parole, and I wanted to see them in that sort of risky situation as well. It, and it ended up being an amazing process to work with them. Uh, Lynn, how does that, I mean, I know Cédouard Lamay is, is very different in, in form of, uh, from Le Cirque du Soleil, but is the, can, does the cre creative process at Le Cirque du Soleil compare or are there parallels to what uh, he just uh, uh, told? Well, I think there are several things that influence uh, how you create and where you came from. Uh, Cirque du Soleil was essentially, at its very source, street performers who lived their lives in the streets. I still remember the story that Guy used to tell about sleeping on the park bench outside one of the big hotels in London. And that, for him, was a reminder of the roots that he had in the company. And at Cirque, what is important are the roots and the extending roots that we've been able to build over the years. I joined the company in 1992. At that time, I was responsible for the Quebec Gymnastics Federation and coached national team members in Canada. And Cirque said, I want you. And my first question was, why? <laughs> the company was growing, and these street performers had a lot of foresight. They could see forward. They could see a broader reach of the circus world. So for quite a few years, I spent time going out and getting gymnasts into Cirque du Soleil. We have Philippe Chartrand, Amélie Majar, all of these people who were either retiring or at the end of their gymnastics career joined in Cirque. That's what I love about Cirque, is that ability to go out and annex a variety of performers going from street performers to pure circus artists to opera singers to clowns to gymnasts, trampolinists, synchronized swimmers is going out and extending its reach and even I say sometimes is Cirque du Soleil really a circus or is Cirque du Soleil its brand for many regroupings of talent that exist. In other words, pushing the frontiers of what the circus can mean. And there are other companies around the world who are doing the same thing. It's not just a Cirque du Soleil thing. So for me, the richness of the company was being able to reach out and take the talent from around the world. And Patrice Aubertin, who is here this evening, uh, also started out in gymnastics just like me, okay? We were circuited pretty quickly, and Patrice was really smart because then he went to school at the National Circus School. Bravo, Patrice, and he's really extended his reach. So we've all had our paths, just as many of our artists who were Russian acrobats who are now creating acts for us, etc. So really extending that reach, it's like a very broad plane tree, pulling in and taking it for itself. And I love the fact that within Cirque, each of these individual companies, and we think of Set Droit de la Main as one, and there are many others, as well as Cirque du Soleil, have taken their own orientation and that we can all call it circus. Can you tell us a bit about the creative processes? Uh, because even though you've you brought in very pe various people from various disciplines, you also bring in uh, directors from outside. And how, how does that work in terms of the creative process? Because you have at the same time a brand, a signature, but at the same time you need to reinvent yourself. So can you tell us about that interaction and how that works out? When I first came to Cirque, uh, the director of Note was Franco Dragon who is a fantastic, uh, not just circus, but stage uh, director and creator, obviously. And through the 90s, we were basically using uh, Franco and his team, along with Gilles Saint-Croix, Dominique Lemieux, uh, Michel Kreit, uh, and this was a great team. However, even with the greatest teams, 
Some people, and this is normal in the creative world, need new challenges. And this is where a person like Robert Lepage, who is both a playwright, a great actor, etc., came into play within the company. And Philippe Ducouflet, with our show, the, uh, did the Olympics in Albertville in 1992, uh, was a great dancer and a great choreographer in France, ended up at Cirque du Soleil on two occasions, of which one worked, because you know what? Sometime there's a fit and sometime there's a miss. And I think that's one of the wonderful things that Cirque has been able to invest in is people and taking a risk to make something which is truly original and taking us in another direction. Obviously, on um, uh, a Michael show, as we have in Vegas, you're going to work with a different team than you are if you're working on Ka, which is highly technological and highly acrobatic in many ways, but also took a strong dramaturgy. So being able to go out and not only recruit artists, but go out and think about who you'd like to play with next. And I think that's part of the growth and success of Cirque, is to be able to go out and pull these things in. And Cirque's not the only company that does that, but certainly a way to broaden the scope of how the world perceives Cirque or Circus as a performance art. You, I think you referred uh, earlier to the uh, Los Angeles show uh, when you're talking about... Uh, Philippe de Courlais. Exactly. Yes. Which had a, apparently it was a great show, but it had a very short stay in L.A. Right. Um, it, it, and this is something that I've been trying to understand. The Cirque has had a tremendous success in, Los An in, in um, Las Vegas, but outside of, of Las Vegas, it, it has run into difficulties setting up permanent shows. Do, why is that? Do you have an explanation? It or? has to do with the demographics of Las Vegas, and this is one of the world's best kept secrets. Vegas receives over 40 million visitors a year. And when you go and visit any city in the world, London, New York, Tokyo, wherever you want to go in the world, the things that you want to do are eat, be entertained through sport or through art, to stay in a great hotel. And in Vegas, the big thing is gambling. But when people go to Vegas, they also do other things. And with Vegas, because of their uh, tourist bureau, if you want to call it that, have a good handle on how many people come to Vegas each year and how they will use their money. Playing, seeing shows, shopping, and I'm missing one, eating. eating. Yes, I forgot eating, it's, I haven't eaten today. Um, and they have really clear demographics, and you also have important investors there. For example, the MGM brand group, uh, Bellagio, etc. These are big groups. So this allows us to create a variety of different shows for different tastes. They extend from Zumanity, the sexy, provocative show, which some people find a little too edgy, to the classical Cirque in Mystère, to the water show. It gave us, and I was fortunate enough to work there in that era, to really stretch our wings on what we could do, not only with the show, but what we could do with an audience. And while people laugh at me, when I go to, to uh, Las Vegas, I do two things for sure. I go to see Sumanity, and I go to see O, just to realize how different two shows can be on completely different ranges. So it's this notion also of staying connected with circus roots, but really extending its possible reach in a community. But you know what? There aren't any other Vegases in the world. 
Do you, from, from, your, from your look from outside, uh, do you, what do you, can you tell us about the creative process at Le Cirque du Soleil as opposed to the smaller right. uh, circus companies? And um, I, guess, I guess I'll sort of subvert your question and, and, and continue with, yes. <laughs> with what Lynn was talking about. Uh, and, but I'll come back to it. Um, Lynn's absolutely right. Vegas is a unique place. It's, it's kitschy and great. It's, uh, uh, you know, the first time I went there, I, I went there sort of holding my nose, thinking, oh, I'm doing this for research. You know, I know it sounds terrible. But, um, Everybody <laughs> says that. <laughs> but but it, was, it sort of was true in a sense, because I, I was thinking, well, I don't sort of belong here. I'm not you know, like that. But, but I do, absolutely. Everyone finds their, their niche. Uh, everyone finds their, their place within, within that fantasy land. Uh, it, it's like a Disney world for adults. Um, I wrote an article at one point uh, referring to it as Hyper America. Uh, it's like America in a can. It's got everything there. The, the, the you know, all the, the, the gruesome stuff, but also the possibility, the sheer sense of possibility. And Sith has tapped into that uh, in an amazing way in Vegas. Um, Iris, Iris was really unfortunate. The, the, the Los Angeles, uh, yeah, Los Angeles show, uh, because it was an amazing show, and the uh, basically, um, this was like the third version, the circus version of a show De Couflet had been working on as a choreographer for a number of years. That there had been Iris and Deux Iris as dance shows in France, and then, then he was invited to Cirque du Soleil and, and revamped it and circled it, um, <laughs> circled it up. Um, but it was actually a, an amazing marriage of, of his dance vocabulary and the Cirque du Soleil uh, vocabulary, both of which were tapping into this, the Hollywood vocabulary. And that show, I think, should have worked better, but there were all sorts of reasons, that, amongst others, the, the, the location, the, how the tourists don't spend much time in Hollywood and would rather be on the beach, and, uh, issues like that. Um, but seeing a Cirque du Soleil show, for instance, uh, in Chicago, you know, Banana Spiel, or, or seeing, um, uh, what was it, the Zarkana in New York, honestly, it didn't, for me, feel as natural as it did in, in Vegas. You get off the plane in Vegas and you think, okay, well, I was there for research, but everyone else says, <laughs> yeah. I can relax, okay, let, let, entertain me. But you know, the, there's the entertain me, but there's also the intellectuals want to be entertained, and there, there's Ka, and there's you know, the different crowds that want different things, and, and the nostalgics with love, and the, the Beatles love show. Uh, so so you, you have all of that on offer. And it is a, a surreal, hyper-real place at the same time. And Silk was, Silk uh, was, uh, I think, really, really um, uh, found the right, the perfect venue to build its, its empire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I use that term um, knowingly, not, not in the you know, negative way, but uh, it is a global company. It's a global company at, at many levels, Glo global company in the sense that it, uh, it brings in what, 140 nationalities, or, I forget, 100, 100 some odd nationalities of performers and, and creators within the company. Um, it, it, it has shows on every continent except Africa, I think. Um, and, and Antarctica. And Antarctica. We've stayed course, away yeah. from that one, clearly. <laughs> that could be, it could be a good concept show with, uh, with Disney, Frozen. <laughs> um, I have two young daughters. Yeah. I know my princess movies. Casting, <laughs> casting would be tough. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and also, they're involved in um, social, social circuits. And this is something, this is something interesting. Um, that said, Soleil and other companies as well have, uh, have um, invested in, uh, in every sense of the term. Uh, they basically developed a, an effective working model to train uh, circus trainers. Uh, to work with at-risk youth in, in various countries. And to a certain extent, Cirque Soleil with Cirque du Monde and its various sure. uh, different names of so, so, social circus organizations um, has set up something global there as well um, with a certain extent of, I guess, arm's length distance as well. Like they're, they're not out there as the corporate giants are dictating things. They're actually doing good. <laughs> so so the, the, it's an interesting example of um, globalism, a uh, global company, uh, which actually reaches out in very different ways. Uh, I guess another aspect, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the, the five types of globalism, so sorry. 
the prof and me. Um, the, the ecological aspect as well. They've been very involved in, in ecological uh, concerns uh, from, from the building itself to their involvement in, in foundations as well. Um, and all of this through, well, much of this through the success of the, sh the shows in Vegas. Vegas is financing all of this. Or much Even of this. benefits. Benefits a lot. Yeah. So you're benefits. saying that it's essentially for economic reasons only. It's, it has nothing to do with uh, the product or the creative process that it has worked in LA and it hasn't worked elsewhere. Um, uh, Las Vegas. Uh, Las Vegas, sorry. Yeah. Vegas. But at the same time, Las Vegas is a very strange place in the sense that it, you know, hotels have their malls and, and everything is, is designed to trap, entrap you, essentially. I mean, you, you sort of can't see the light of day for most of the uh, hotels or, or, or malls. So you're, you're sort of stuck there. And you, it's a labyrinth uh, setup. And at the same time, I've never seen so many Cartier stores, Louis Vuitton, and all of these luxury goods mm. that are somehow accessible. Oh, I'm there for a weekend. I'll, sure, I'll buy a watch. And mm. you, you have that, that, that sort of sense of letting go, people, you know, this is my one vacation, I'm going to spend, and I'm going to treat myself. And in a sense, it's, it's interesting, because it's like elite-ish, in a sense, it's, it's like you know, high art codes, uh, but open to the general public. Mm -hmm. So the general public can basically have that experience of seeing a Robert Lepage, a Robert Lepage directed show, you know, opera and theater director, uh, doing you know, the, the, this amazing spectacle on, on one of the largest, the largest rotating stage mm -hmm. <laughs> on Earth. So it, it's like a place that, that uh, allows inhibitions, um, you know, spending inhibitions uh, to, to, to shed. And you see that sense of people allowing themselves to invent themselves mm -hmm. as big spenders. It's a little bit like Peter Pan. We're all familiar <laughs> with and Neverland. Yeah. Okay, there is one Las Vegas there, but you have to remember that in Vegas there are people paying five cent slots yep. and people who are spending a lot of money. And it's a good opportunity for a lot of people, particularly in the United States, Canada, and Asia, to see Cirque where they would not see it at home. And there is also another business difference between going to see a big, big top show and going to see a show in Las Vegas. And that is, when the circus comes to town, a family <coughs> will go out, a husband, a wife, and perhaps some children, and have an evening out together. They may have a dinner as well. They'll enjoy the show. The tip, uh, Big Top is still a beautiful, intimate environment, okay? It creates its own environment. With the Vegas shows, the trip is different. Not too many kids, and they're not particularly welcomed in the casinos to begin with. <laughs> Bigger theaters, and people who are out there, one way or another, to spend. Okay, whether they spend on gambling, eating, a hotel room, entertainment, they're there to spend. I've always, and this is a personal thing, it's not a cert thing, I love the big top shows, and I'm not talking about the shows themselves. Having been mother to a few of them, I wouldn't dare say who is my favorite child. I would never say that. But on the flip side, in terms of an environment, the big top is the charming circus venue, which still in and of itself attracts an audience to be there, to be close to the artist, to be in close proximity, to eat popcorn, to go out and have a break and a smoke at the same time, if the city lets you do it. Um, uh, it it's two completely different environments that offer two completely different entertainment types. And so you have people going to Vegas, but they'll still go see the show. The other thing about good old Los Angeles is they made a beautiful theater for us in uh, the Kodak Theater. But Los Angeles is really a film city. And Philip used it, actually filmed quite well like, within his uh, thing. But the people there think about Los Angeles as a film city. 
as opposed to Las Vegas, which is an entertainment of all sorts city. So that's a part of the business of Cirque du Soleil. But the reach of Cirque du Soleil is in the diversity of its product and being able to make an offering even though it's a different offering that will either touch the people who go to the big top or into one of the bigger theaters. Um, we've been talking a lot about the Cirque du Soleil, yeah. but we also have, I mean, there's yes. a whole new generation of uh, companies and mm -hmm. even those have become mature. Uh, we, we were thrilled as, as their artists become more mature too. Yes, exactly. But um, how, how do you maintain, and it's a question for the both of you, but how do you maintain the creative spark in mature companies uh, as they get bigger, more established, and uh, more successful? I have to say that in writing the spark, that was one of the biggest challenges, and it was really trying to go back to the fundamentals of human beings in general, okay, and not just a circus or an artistic population. The recognition that we are all, from the day we're born, and we're the only animals to have it, we are all and all have a creative potential. And I think uh, what Cirque does, as do all of the other uh, circus companies working here in Quebec, really tries to tap into the creative resources of people who would not have considered themselves before as creative beings. A gymnast is not necessarily a creative being. At Cirque, and I know uh, Samuel was there and several of the, all the sets, well, I think were there at one point in time, Cirque really presses the, the limits. You go in and you play taiko drums and you go in and you make little plays and you have to do things without talking and all of that. For people who are coming from another world, those are the difficult breakthroughs that you have to get through in order to move on to what we know as our modern circus era. But that does not eliminate the fact that there are singers and musicians, etc., who could be working in all kinds of fields. They could be working in film, okay? They could be working on stage. They could be working in a variety of ways. And the, one of the biggest catalysts is how do you get those people to work together as a team? Because we're picking from here Russians, Chinese, some Australians, South Americans, Canadians, Americans, 60 cultures, actually, 60 cultures. Um, how do we bring that to fruition? How do we get these gymnasts? And I remember when we were working on Mystère, and this was my first show at Zurich. Uh, we had British gymnasts, we had American gymnasts, we had Canadian gymnasts, we had French circus artists, and we used to have these uh, workshops on getting to know each other and work together. And one Friday afternoon, and this is a true story, in our studio uh, in the old Angus shops, the French artist, teeterboard artist, put his head through the wall, okay, because the gymnasts were, he felt that they were so stuck on technique and not on performance. And it was then at that point in time where we sort of stepped back and said, how are we going to help the gymnast make its direction toward the center and how are we going to help the circus artists and other performers from the performance arts come to work together? And that's how the training studio was basically built at Cirque du Soleil. I'm not talking about mortar, but being able to take all of these unique talents and strengths and bring them together so that they could work together for a year, two years, 10 years, 15 years. This was not something we were investing in for six months or one tour. We were investing in the long-term development. And in those days, we were spending almost a year in training before we would open a new show just to get all of those elements together and make each person shine. So this notion of creativity, 
and teamwork and risk taking. The gymnasts were good at risk taking. Some of the circus artists weren't, some are, were. I mean, all of these elements, these seven elements, had to come together over time. It doesn't happen in a week, two weeks. It doesn't happen in a staging session, OK? It happens over time. And they grow over time. So a Terry Bartlett from Britain, who was the gymnast that our French circus artist was attacking in 1992, is now the clown in O. Good transition. <laughs> That's the creative level at the individual level, but at the enterprise level, maybe uh, Patrick, you can address that. Uh, yeah. You know, with, with maturity, there comes, uh, I guess, some sort of maybe uh, comfort, or uh, and you need to take risks, continue to reinvent yourself. And how how do the mature companies keep that spark? Oh. Um, may I subvert your question again? <laughs> <laughs> You can take a seat if you want. We're allowed to make our own rules, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and, but I will come back to it. Um, I was coming in very much from the outside, and what, what fascinated, what I found absolutely fascinating about the about the circus world in terms of the creative process and, and the codes and the language, um, what was well, f first of all, there was a, a language of um, technical acrobatic uh, ability, feet, la prouesse. And that, coming from theater, uh, was extremely surprising. Like, I knew, but it, but it was surprising to what extent uh, their entire bodies, their entire being is invested in the, in, in the performance. The action isn't between, you know, isn't between the bodies. It's not between characters on stage. It, it is. But, but the real, the fundamental action is on their very body. Their body becomes... Um, an extension of our own projections, our own uh, anticipations. And that I found absolutely uh, fascinating and rich in terms of um, vocabulary. Um, look, look, looking at uh, what, what the um, uh, circuit students, the National Circuit School students were, uh, uh, were learning, uh, extremely high technical ability, um, instilling creativity also, uh, but the focus, the emphasis, you know, the, the, these kids are in there from 8, eight in the morning to 8 at night, and they're, they're just working constantly, constantly, constantly. Uh, I'd given a, a, a class at one point, uh, and uh, I was uh, three minutes late, and I, I was mortified, and I thought, oh, if this were a theater class, everyone would be outside smoking type of thing. And, but they're all sitting there waiting, and they're just like so hungry, and just saying, wow, these, these kids just are absolutely engaged. Their whole being, their whole body is engaged in what they do. And that is extremely rich. Uh, already, like, to, to, to ask them to, to put themselves uh, on the line like this, um, I hadn't seen this as much in theater. Um, uh, just code, codes of interaction, for instance. Um, but are you saying that that's what makes even old companies stay uh, uh, on their toes because they get this influx of young people that are so intense. Absolutely, circus is a very, very, very young uh, field. Uh, at one point, circus artists you know, can't can't go on for very you know, for physical reasons, um, but it is it is a, a young field. Uh, but so, some of what I've been seeing also in, in a lot of the younger companies is that these these old, older, uh, you know, 35, uh, 40 year old uh, circus artists are, are actually developing uh, their skills as, uh, as directors, uh, metteurs en scène. Um, they're also uh, becoming interested in, in dramaturgy, the, the, the writing, the narrative of, of the circus. I'm thinking of people like uh, Anna Ward uh, with her company, uh, Nord Nord-Est, and they have a show opening next week, I think, at Prospero. Um, who, you know, she, she's bringing in an extremely rich, uh, she worked with uh, uh previously, she's bringing in an extremely rich experience uh, of the circus, but also working with interdisciplinary experimental theater, dance artists, and, and creating this hybrid object. Uh, Adrienne Leclerc, um, who's a contortionist who worked with everyone, uh, I think at one point or another, and she, she just did a, a, a master's at uh, Université du Québec à Montréal, focusing on circus dramaturgy and trying to uh, uh, unveil the codes of this dramaturgy. And, and basically, so you have 
an emerging generation of circus artists who are also taking ownership over their creative process. Um, and that, I think, is extremely important. And I think that's also going to affect me, just coming to your question. I think that, that's going to... <laughs> um, <laughs> that is... <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> how did the older how companies the, integrate that? Yeah, okay. I, I, think that I think this is how uh, a lot of the older companies actually are, are benefiting from you know, decades of experience, uh, circus experience. Uh, not always drawing in y young people to do th need, need interesting, exciting things, but also drawing on those you know, 20 years of experience. So you're not saying that young, young companies are more creative? That's not what you're saying? Or, uh, or is there some truth to that? Well, I, if you I, look at the Montreal ecosystem. Okay, how, how do you define creative? Uh, they're, they're edgier, they're, 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 trying, they're, they're trying riskier things, they're putting themselves in, in, in awkward, interesting, uh, uh, essential situations. Um, but, you know, there, there, there's economic risk, there's artistic risk, there's various ways of assessing risk in this case. Um, yeah. Well, the thing is, though, you, it helps to bring in new blood, and I think that Cirque du Soleil uh, has tried, certainly in the last two decades or yeah. a decade and a half, to bring in new creative talent, taking risks on people um, from completely different fields. And it, it's in costume design, it's in this, but it's also uh, through the artists themselves. They build on it. And I would say that even the, the uh, directors, I won't say older directors, because no director really wants to feel old, uh, but the directors who have been around for a longer period of time have that wealth of challenges coming in from the new kids on the block, uh, which is a positive force. And similarly, to see artists grow in first to coaches and then acrobatic designers and then eventually uh, an assistant to a director or an artistic coordinator in Las Vegas or an artistic director in Las Vegas, to see them moving up very gradually within the scale because they're creating our next generation mm -hmm. of people who will help us build the shows. That's one good thing about this, the circus community is it feeds itself. Yeah. It puts it back in and it goes out somewhere else and it will continually weave in and, in and out. And I was really happy to see the performance today because not so many years ago, Samuel was performing in Alegria, if I'm not mistaken. So to see all of these people going in and being successful and developing their own approaches, which are not necessarily a Cirque approach, but a very successful approach and a successful thematic for their work is really important. We don't live and die in one little circus. We all grow eventually. It's interesting. And that's you... one, sorry, that's one thing I've noticed also in, in, in this industry is that people do move around. People do work with different companies and, and learn a lot and gain a lot from this. Um, and, and one of the examples we, we haven't really talked about in, structurally in terms of creative process is Sadou uh, Adlamay, who you know, did, did, did this uh, performance earlier. Um, there you have now six uh, artistic directors. So, so imagine you know, six creative impulses, six desires to constantly be doing stuff, to, 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 to be developing new shows, to explore, to, to become obsessed with themes. So this, you have a, a company there where basically they'll never run out of ideas. You have six artistic directors who are pushing for the, for the project and they work together, and, of course. And yeah. in honesty to them, they all showed it when they were in their careers at Cirque du Soleil. Right. You could see that emerge. Honestly, I could see that emerging. I understood why they moved on and mm -hmm. why they moved forward in their own companies because they all had that, I'll have to use the term, the spark to be creative in their own right and not simply do 365 shows a year. How, you, both of you touched upon it just uh, briefly, but how does the, because the companies are not competing really against themselves. They're, they're, I mean, they're competing against all forms of entertainment and just 
touring the world. Mm -hmm. But how do they bounce each other off uh, their ideas and their, I mean, are there, do they um, inspire each other? What's the interaction? I mean, people move back and front, but I mean, uh, between I'd, the companies. I like to think that we support each other, okay? We're the visionaries from the outside looking inwards. Um, we, we've learned from each other, but we've stayed honest to what we are. Cet droit is cet droit, and Cirque du Soleil is Cirque du Soleil, and each one of the companies here in Quebec has their own unique identity, but has in some way shared or fed either through the circus school and their participation in that, or through their performance skills, or a variety of, you know, uh, one said droit de la main worked on the show Iris in, in uh, Los Angeles. Okay, there's a sharing that was going on even at that point in time, because that particular said droit needed an experience, but she was still a said droit and she'd been with Cirque before. So that willingness to be open enough now. I would say in the late 1990s, it was rock and roll, a little bit of rock and roll, but now there's an openness which will allow people to try this experience at one place and, not, and still continue to work within their own environment. And I think that's important because they're very different environments. It was very much an ecosystem. Yeah. And that, that, that's the, that was the first thing I noticed starting to work on, on, on local circus, which, which isn't really local circus. It's, it's wider than just Quebec circus, but um, it's a family. It's absolutely, you know, family arguments, I guess, like, like any family, but it's a family. Um, and coming from circus, uh, from, sorry, from theater, where there were very distinct you know, clans, <laughs> I felt it quite refreshing, I have to say, uh, to, to, to what extent people actually support each other. And work. I have to say that, in, in all honesty, to the circuit, National Circus School, yep. uh, that they've contributed immensely to all of us. Okay, so vicariously through the circus school itself, it's fi filtering back mm -hmm. into the companies. So there has to be, it's a little bit like our own ecology, okay, and how it turns around. What is that cycle that it's going through? And as I watch it, first of all, when Toyu went up and the National Circus School was across the street and we had access and we could see what they were doing in their shows, et cetera, we could pick some of the best artists for the next show at Cirque, and then seeing those artists go off and join another company or become a coach or become this, we're creating in Quebec, I can't say this, that this is worldwide, in Quebec we have a somewhat healthy ecology. Is there like a, would you, in closing, is there such a thing as a Montreal or a Quebec signature then, even though with, despite the differences between the companies? Um, uh, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't know enough about exactly what is happening in Quebec. Yeah. I know the circus school in, mm -hmm. in Quebec City. Uh, well, uh, but um, I, I think that everyone benefits from the bigness and grandioseness of Cirque and that Cirque benefits from every single one of the smaller troops, and the school. It's, it's a perfect ecology because one pushes the other and pushes people on. The, cir the circus school wants their kids to get jobs. We all need jobs. So they'll go into a multitude of places, even if they go around the world, okay, to other places in the world and get jobs. It started from a relatively healthy circus ecology here in Quebec. And I won't say Quebec or Montreal. No, I meant Quebec as a province. province. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, generally, I would say the healthy ecology is good not just for our circus companies, but for a bunch of them around the world as well. And, uh, yeah, uh, to answer that question, I, I'm answering that question. Yeah. Um, we're to we're getting there. <laughs> the, I guess, Quebec circus. Um, 
it's fundamental specificity compared to some of the other circuits I've seen in, in Europe and the States um, is a sense of legitimacy, first of all. You know, this is the first state that recognized circus officially as an art form and, and subsidizes it uh, through the Conseil des Arts et des Lettres du Québec. Um, this is an amazing thing. You know, other provinces don't you know, ha I, have they known? They haven't yet. Uh, in the States, don't even, don't even think about it. Uh, so this fundamental sense of legitimacy, um, strong sense of um, creative know-how, and agency, I think, are things that come out of a confidence, a fundamental confidence in, in their artistry, basically, and, technical, and high technical, technical skill, I would have to add, from, from the school, yeah. Um, I know that we've run over uh, oh, before a little bit, but I, I, I would really like to uh, have the audience uh, the opportunity to ask some questions to our guests. There's a microphone down there. If you're, uh, you've braved the storm, then surely you can brave the, <laughs> go down the stairs and ask a couple of questions uh, to our guests. Uh, I can't really see if there's anyone there or making its way because oh, uh, the, yeah, the light is quite little. bright. But, um, I think it's a unique opportunity to speak with our guests, so you should taste it, Monsieur. Thank you for the presentation. The question concerns the language and the values embodied in the language. It struck me the, the Frenchman who put his head through <laughs> the, the, the wall and the English. Uh, so the question I'm asking you, there's in different cultures uh, and there's values embodied in, in the language. How does the CERC um, get people from China and from all over the world to, do they all speak English or French, is that it? Um, I would say from uh, 20 years of experience uh, with the artists, we speak pidgin. Okay, a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Ni hao, xie xie. Thank you, merci. Bonsoir. Okay, I think that uh, through good example, because Cirque has always been, at least since the late 1980s, very international in its reach of where you're going to get people, uh, the company ensures that the cultural values, or tries to ensure that the cultural values, not only of Cirque, but of the artists who are coming from different places in the world are respected, not only respected, taken on by other people. And this applies to the employees as much as it does to the artists, and it applies to the directors just as well as it does with the person in our mail room downstairs, is that openness to the realization at the circus school and at Cirque du Soleil, and probably in some of the smaller companies as well, that this is a multicultural existence here in spite of what's happening in Quebec right now. We have to be able to be mobile, not just in Quebec, not just in Canada, not just in North America, but around the world. So we all learn from each other, and I learned a lot from the artists who came to Cirque, if only to be polite. <laughs> One thing, I, one thing I've noticed also to, to, to uh, piggyback on that, on that answer um, at the National Circus School, but also working on this project, um, we would just switch back and forth between French, French and English. But French was the sort of working language. Uh, but even if we're working in English, uh, some of what I've heard from, from people and a few people in the room here tonight uh, have told me things who have come from the US and from elsewhere. Basically, uh, we care about culture here. And the, that for them was an extremely important draw. Uh, no matter you know, what language the culture is being lived in, we care about culture, and that, that's important. Thank you. Sir, Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I have a question that perhaps um, involves other students as well. Um, I guess as students that are still you know, shaping our path and perhaps most of us don't have any actual work experience um, in the fields that we want to be in. What would you say uh, that both of you are some of the key points in your personal paths that allowed you to work in the industry that you're mm -hmm. in right now? And what are some of the general tips that you would... Um, Can I, I'll start this one. 
um, being good parents. Okay, the one wealth that my parents left in me was the belief that a child should be exposed to many different experiences and many different types of activity. Nowadays, we tend to push our children, and this has nothing to do with the National Circus School, we tend to push our children into gymnastics. At age seven, you're doing 10 hours a week, uh, 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 homeschooling, uh, all of this kind of stuff. But the wealth of our artists to be will not be limited to a single area like gymnastics or strict circus training or piano or opera singing. The circus artist of today is polyvalent. In other words, can do many different things, either well or very well. That starts when you're a kid. So my first message is out to the parents out there, allow your kids to experience a great variety of things and they'll shape it down at the right time, but they will carry with them for their entire lives the ability to reach in to those pockets that are there and bring them together in whatever trade, art, or whatever they use. I thank my parents for exposing me to the world of arts broadly and not narrow. And I, I would say, um... Don't wait for someone to discover you. Just go ahead and do it, and just dive, dive, dive into it. Uh, I started in theater uh, with, with that attitude, and okay, well, for, for the short story, I shaved my head and quit school on um, opening night of the, my play I was directing, so that was a bit extreme, but... Um, Did it all come back? Y yeah, <laughs> <laughs> except this spot here, yeah. Um, yeah. Do it. Don't, don't, wait for, don't wait for things to happen. You take charge of your own life. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions dans la salle? Oui. Um, I was just wondering, and maybe this is specifically for Lynn, but um, with Cirque losing a couple hundred jobs last, early last year, it was blamed on the economic downturn. Um, I was wondering if it was possible that the Cirque had overextended itself with too many shows in too many different places, um, and whether that the, uh, whether if the economy has improved and the Cirque is now doing better financially, perhaps? Okay, I, I will answer this question. First of all, you're looking at a person who last March finished working at Cirque, okay? Last March being the time where the project that I was working on at the time was canceled by Cirque, hence the, the job uh, was removed because I had retired some years ago as president. So it was something that was painfully irrespective of whether you had your job or didn't have your job at Cirque du Soleil. It was a difficult and painful period. But on the flip side, Cirque was smart enough to count all the chickens and make sure that I went around the world to take stock of what was happening first in the markets with the shows and then with its people. If you're going to close down three shows or two shows for a variety of different reasons, obviously you're going to cut in your head count. And although it was difficult for us to accept as individuals, we knew that with our path forward, which didn't mean making two shows a year, et cetera, which we had been doing mm -hmm. for a long period of time, coming to the realization that we didn't need the man, and I shouldn't be saying we, but I still feel like we, okay? I'm part of Cirque in, and still do projects with Cirque, but the thing is, coming to the realization that our markets were no longer growing at the rate they were, 
in the 90s and 2000s. There has to be, Cirque is a business, and it had to make a decision that was very, very difficult. On the flip side, and again, because I was a person that was caught up in that, Cirque did treat me fairly in the process. And that's, it's difficult for me uh, to say that, and then two months later be, be doing something with the International Gymnastics Federation on behalf of Cirque. Um, but a lot of us went through um, that growth. Difficult to handle, but you have to, as a big business, you have to be in contact with the entire world. You've got to know what's happening around the world and make timely business decisions. And if letting people go is part of it, then do it well. And I'm not saying everybody is joyous. I was not joyous, but I understood the timeliness of the decision. We'll Will CERT continue to produce new shows at a slower rate? Yes. Will the National Circus School continue to produce excellent uh, acrobats who, and, and circus artists who can have jobs in many different places of the world? Yes. We know that. Smaller circus companies tend to be uh, more movable, malleable, and changeable with the times and the economy. And that was our reality. But I sit here tonight. <laughs> so, so I guess closing remark maybe, uh, are you optimistic now that uh, uh, with the decisions that we're taking next year that they've turned the corner on that? Uh... As long as they head towards that in a very um, controlled and inspired manner, okay? You have to control, but you also have to inspire yourself to move forward, and those are two very difficult things to bring together. It's not an easy job, and I have to say, I'm glad not to be the president and COO. <laughs> Madame Cousineau, um, I came here partly because of you. I fell in love with your writing, awesome. and. Uh, it's nice to see you in Thank person. You. I'd like to make some comments on uh, what the two speakers spoke about. They we're in an academic place, and maybe we got some academic answers. You asked the question, uh, how come the CERT uh, succeeds in Las Vegas and can't do it in other cities? The answer is very simple. Uh, people come to Vegas and I've been coming for years. Jubilee and Follies Berger, I think, played for 50 years. And every time I went to see it, it seemed to be new. That's kind of what you do in Las Vegas. It's a transient group. It's not people necessarily coming to spend. It's a transient group. In Los Angeles, people come in there and indeed, Disney does extremely well. In Orlando, you have a facility there which does very well too because people keep coming to Orlando once every 10 years. The rest of the world, the New York and London's, Don't. no, 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 no. That's the simple answer I wanted to, to hear. The other thing I want to direct to uh, our academic uh, speaker, and that is this. Do you, do you not feel that the circus, like all of show business, is cyclical? We had the ice shows once upon a time when I was a little kid, and we had the ice capades and the ice follies, and it was terrific. Now we have Disney on ice with 20 companies going, whatever the Feld organization wants to put together. Do you think that the circus will start to fade out? I'm noticing that in Las Vegas, they're discounting tickets now, 50 bucks for some of the Zoomanities. Right, yeah, Every, yeah everything is definitely cyclical. I think what, what we're seeing here is that uh, we, we, we did go from, from the traditional circus to 
various new forms of circus, the new circus emerging from France, various new cabaret circuses emerging from Germany as well. And we, we have here a hybrid of the traditional commercial circus with elements of the new circus. And, and that you know, the Cirque du Soleil model was dominant for a good 20, 25 years. And then continuing into that cycle and, and creating new micro cycles, you have Seven Fingers of the Hand, Cirque et Loise, uh, which were the next sort of generation of companies. And basically, we're entering into smaller and smaller cycles in a sense, different approaches to circus. Uh, but I do, I do still feel that we're um, absolutely not at the tail end of of the of this circus cycle. No, I, I, I do feel there's. Uh, well, you know, I think that's a, lot a, more to, to, a to, very to good point to close this this <laughs> talk. So I I want to thank you, Lynn. I want to thank you, Patrick, thank you, for Lynn. this very interesting conversation tonight. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful evening, and I hope that we will see all of you possibly in the next weeks. And thanks for making it out here on the yes, stormy evening. Yes, especially tonight. <laughs> the audience. Thank you.